Hey everyone, welcome back to another week of the Triple Play. This is Danielle. We have a really exciting show today after a really exciting win this weekend for the Vols. Um, I'm joined by Nathan Odom and Andrew Robinson once again. It's great to have them back. So let's just go ahead and jump into it. Um, the Vols just absolutely dominated Kentucky this weekend, 50 to 16. Feels good for me. Haven't really talked much to my dad about the game, but I can tell that he's hurting and that's what's beautiful. But uh, I mean, if you just look at this game, we're five and five now in the season. We're getting back to where everybody's hoping we could have been at the beginning of the season, striving for that seven and five. Not too bad. Uh, I guess the main thing we have to talk about is Josh Dobbs. How can we thank him for everything that's been happening with this team? I think we just keep putting it back out in the field because that seems to be what he loves doing more than anything else, and uh, we love him for it as well. He's the saving grace of Tennessee football. You know, fourth season, everybody was wondering, after, what we do after this year, Warley's going to be gone, who's going to be his back, who's going to come in next year, put the weight on the shoulders of a freshman. Now you got Dobbs, and uh, things feel good. But they feel back to normal around here, and it, it's definitely a good feeling. Definitely. Things do feel like they're back to normal, and it's just crazy to think about how at one point in this season we were really struggling, especially not being able to score a touchdown in back-to-back -back games against Florida and Ole Miss, I believe it was. And now in two consecutive games we've scored 95 points, 45 at South Carolina and 50 this weekend. I mean, it's easy to say Josh is to thank for that. Um, I feel like just from everything I've seen, there's a like new found, I would, I, I would say dominance, but a new found just um, leadership on this team that really just came out of nowhere. But I mean, a lot of people were expecting it from him, waiting to see that. But just this weekend alone, he was nine for, 19 for 27, 297 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions. That's just passing. If you look over at uh, rushing, 10 carries, 48 yards, one touchdown there. Really dominant performance from him. Jalen Hurd also had a big day. 24 carries, 118 yards, and one touchdown. But uh, I think it's also really important to note how Patrick Tolles for Kentucky struggled. Going into the last, or during last week's podcast, we talked about how he was going to be the nucleus for that team. If he does well, the team does well. But um, he ended up getting shaken up during their second uh, series of the game. Uh, went into the locker room for a while. Whenever he came back, he was just not the same. And you could really tell that. Um, just in his numbers to passing 13 for 25, 168 yards, no touchdowns with one interception to uh, Brian Randolph late in the first quarter. But uh, rushing, he was still what you'd expect from him, 14 carries, 29 yards, one touchdown. A lot of people are saying the balls got lucky with this game, but I don't really think that's correct in my opinion. Uh, Kentucky, they They've been like a really strong rushing team this year. That's one thing they've focused on all year, but they only had 94 rushing yards, which was really surprising in my opinion. Yeah, you know, Kentucky was a team that I was worried about running the football, but the more I looked at our defensive line, uh, more importantly, the defensive front seven, it's, just, it's getting better every week. Mm -hmm. It had a little lapse in the middle of the schedule, uh, but, you know, they played Alabama and Ole Miss. Mm -hmm. um, they, they locked down decent against South Carolina, and then this week they returned to what I thought they would be all year, of just run stoppers. And uh, they struggled at times against Kentucky. There were some flaws, and they know that, and uh, it was clear. But they're getting better every week. I don't think Tennessee got lucky. I think we were the better team. Mm -hmm. uh, not only on that given day, I think we're the better team all year. Absolutely. Uh, I remember telling people when Kentucky was 5-1, and one, this team might not make a bowl game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They just they backloaded their schedule, and it is coming back to bite them. Absolutely. But uh, I don't think Tennessee got lucky, but the run defense is definitely getting better, and it's exciting to see. We talked about uh, Kentucky not making a bowl game last yeah. time we were together a couple that weeks ago. That is right, yeah. And now uh, after the loss to Tennessee, they got to go to Louisville, who's got uh, a good defense as well. But mm -hmm. uh, back to Tennessee's defense, I think the bye week before that really helped. It. They play a lot of snap, a lot of snaps anyway, yeah. and just, just getting them some rest and a week to uh, come back and develop and get ready for that game was a big help to them. Absolutely. And uh, this win over Kentucky, it's the 15th straight win at home against Kentucky. Uh, fourth sellout of the season. The fans are really showing up this year. I mean, there was a lot of hype on this team, Team 118 and everything that was uh, going on at the beginning of the season. I feel like the team is slowly starting to live up to that hype. Uh, but, yes, bowl game, definitely something we should focus on. Getting this win, that really helped us out a lot. We have to beat Mizzou or Vandy now. 
Vandy looks like it's going to be the easiest choice. But uh, looking ahead this weekend at Missouri, um, 7.30 game this Saturday on ESPN. SEC Nation's going to be here that morning. It's going to be really fun, really exciting. But whenever it comes down to this weekend against a team that's 8-2, and 5-1 and one in the conference, it's it's easy to go ahead and say, yeah, it's going to depend on how Matty Mock plays. It's a lot like Patrick Tolles. However he plays, that's how the team will react. But I think the one thing that they're going to really need to stop – or the one player they're really going to need to stop is Russell Hansborough. Beginning of the season, he was favored as a Heisman candidate. People were saying he could be thrown in there into the mix with like Marcus Mariota and players like that. But um, this weekend, whenever they beat uh, Texas A&M 34 to 27, Hansborough alone had 20 carries, 199 yards, which was a career high, along with two touchdowns. Um, I, I, in my personal opinion, definitely the key to this game is going to be stopping their rushing game because Hansbro can be a monster whenever he's out there really hot. Yeah, um, him and Matty Mock together, that, that combination. Uh, Matty Mock's a good player, mm-hmm. and, and Hansbro has a lot of talent. And when their offense goes, which it hasn't been done a whole lot this year, it's been a little uh, inconsistent, but when it goes, um, you saw Saturday against uh, an A&M mm-hmm. team that just beat Auburn, and, uh, it, it can go. And uh, Tennessee will have to focus on him and uh, contain mm-hmm. both of those guys to uh, get a win in New York. You know, the the crowd will be with them. It should be electric, 7.30 mm-hmm. kick. Uh, the weather actually is supposed to be pretty good. Yeah. Uh, low uh, 50s, I think, mm-hmm. for kick time. So uh, it should be an interesting game for Tennessee. I wouldn't even say it's a must win because I think you're going to beat Vanderbilt. So you're right. going to get to a bowl game. But if you go 7-5, and five, you can find yourself in a good bowl game. Mm-hmm. And uh, But it all starts with, like you said, stopping Hansborough and controlling Matty Mock in the pocket. Mm-hmm. When he gets too much time is when he's affected. So we'll have to do a very good job making sure that he uh, he's pressured out of there. We did it last week against Kentucky, so I don't see why we can't do it again. Definitely. So that'll be a really exciting game uh, this Saturday. This Saturday, like we said, 7.30 kick on ESPN. Um, senior night. It's going to be really emotional, as expected. But I have some good vibes with this game. Hopefully it'll actually work out maybe we'll get another game like this weekend maybe not it might be a miracle but we'll just hope for it but looking at other games in the SEC big game that everybody's talking about Mississippi State finally getting their first loss of the season um from Alabama 25 to 20 uh Alabama's defense really really strong just looking at Dak Prescott's performance uh 27 for 48 290 yards two touchdowns and three interceptions there wasn't really expecting those three interceptions from him. Yeah, I think Alabama's the best team in the country, so uh, I wouldn't put all my eggs in this basket for Dak Prescott. Um, but for Mississippi State, this is a tough loss. Uh, but I, I, you got to see it coming. Mm-hmm. Alabama was rolling at this part of the season, and Nick Saban's got his team playing well. And everybody knows when Nick Saban's teams play well, they don't slip up. And they did this week against Mississippi State, a young team that still hasn't ever felt this way, mm-hmm. being number one, number two in the nation. Uh, I still think they'll be in the top four playoff-wise. Uh, we can talk about that a bit later. Good for Alabama this week if you're a Bama fan. But uh, Mississippi State, still a team to keep your eye on. They're still a good squad. Yeah, you hit your eye on the head. Uh, everything there just... Um, I think I read a stat earlier in the week that said uh, Nick Saban led teams against number one teams in the nation have only given up about nine points a game. Mm-hmm. And they gave up 20, but that was with a late touchdown when the game was right. almost out of reach anyway. Um, they played well. They've been playing well. It's hard to go into Tuscaloosa against Nick Saban Alabama team and win. And uh, mm-hmm. they played, Mississippi State played all right. They played about as well as they could have. They, they mm-hmm. had some turnovers that didn't help them. Um, Prescott, Prescott's still a good player, but uh, tough to win down there in Tuscaloosa. Definitely. And moving on to another game, Georgia upset Auburn this weekend, 34-7. The running game was pretty much all you had to think about with that. Uh, For Georgia, 289 yards there between uh, Nick Chubb and Todd Gurley. Nick Chubb, 19 carries, 144 yards with two touchdowns. Todd Gurley, 29 carries, 138 yards with one touchdown there. But what everybody's talking about, Gurley came back, looked really strong. Now he's out for the remainder of the season. After a four-game suspension that he was out for, he's going to be out with a torn ACL in his left knee. Um, At first, he just left the stadium with what was considered a sore knee. But later, I want to say it was in the late afternoon on Sunday, 
it was released that um, it was a torn ACL. It's just really interesting to think that they're like now George is going to have to go back to just worrying about their freshmen again. I mean, they had two unstoppable running backs that they could just transfer in and out during that game, but now they're just back to focusing on Nick Chubb. I, I personally like Nick Chubb. Uh, I think Nick Chubb is going to be a better running back than Todd Gurley down the road. And it sounds crazy right now to say, but I personally think this helps Georgia. Mm -hmm. Not having to worry about who, who to run here, Nick Chubb or Todd Gurley, because they're both incredibly talented. And not to take away from Todd Gurley. But moving down the road, Nick Chubb, uh, the season's got 1,039 yards and nine touchdowns. They play Charleston Southern, so they'll probably play two quarters. And then they get Georgia Tech at home, who's getting better each week. Definitely. And uh, I expect good things from Nick Chubb. I don't think this will slow Georgia down much. Uh, it might hurt him a little bit in the SEC championship mm -hmm. game. But beyond that, I don't think they'd win that anyway. Um, but Nick Chubb is a great backup. And now he's your starter, and I don't think much will change for Georgia's offense. Mm, I think uh, Georgia's really found their identity the last couple of weeks. It starts with the run. I think early on in the season, they might have been leaning a little too much on mm -hmm. Todd Gurley, and then they, they weren't sure at first what to do with him when he was out. And then they found Nick Chubb, and they're like, hey, this is a good kid, but you know he's also just you know a freshman. We can't you know put all of our weight on his shoulders, and they mm -hmm. haven't. And Hudson Mason's played pretty well. And they've had yeah, a nice definitely. balance, and they've had a, a bunch of good wins since they lost Gurley, and then that win where he was somewhat there mm -hmm. and then lost him. And uh, like Andrew said, they have a, a pretty good-looking rest of the season and then the SC Championship game. Definitely. Moving on, uh, Arkansas shut out LSU 17 to nothing. I don't think anybody was expecting that from Arkansas, but that's a 17-game losing streak that was broken for the Razorbacks. Uh, low stats besides uh, Arkansas's passing. They had 169 yards passing. LSU had 87 Rushing was really low for both teams. Uh, South Carolina beat Florida in overtime, 23-20. to While that is a big win for South Carolina, it's kind of been overshadowed by the fact that Muschamp is out at Florida. He will coach the remainder of the season, but he will not return uh, next year. Not a surprise at all. Everybody was expecting it. The fans in Gainesville had been asking for it. They were chanting it during games. Um, but what's interesting... Uh, about all of this. Granted, Muschamp, um, he's lost 13 of the last 22 games, uh, three-game losing streak at home, but what's really, it's kind of funny in my opinion, is that Steve Spurrier is actually showing some compassion towards him. Um, he was quoted after the game saying that, uh, Spurrier said, quote, I'm getting a little old when you start feeling sorry for the other coach. I do feel for Muschamp. He's a good guy. Um, I know a lot of people would say that Muschamp is not a good guy. That's just the opinion that most people have. But this firing, quote-unquote firing, mainly just a dismissal, I'm not a surprise. But who could be next for Florida is the big question. I would put Dan Mullen at the top of my list at Mississippi State. He's a mm -hmm. Florida guy. Uh, the job's coming open at the right time. Uh, I don't know what he thinks he can still accomplish at Mississippi mm -hmm. State. But... Seeing what he's done there, imagine what he could do in Gainesville. Mm -hmm. I think he's a very likely candidate. I think Bob Stoops in Oklahoma mm -hmm. is a good candidate as well. Uh, those will be my top two for Florida. Uh, hoping neither will come because I think both of them will right. immediately transform that program mm -hmm. and get it back to what it what it was. Uh, but like I said, little must champ. He needed to go. It mm -hmm. was just the time. He's a great coordinator. I would not be surprised if he ends up somewhere else being a defensive coordinator again. But the head coaching thing was just not his gig. Mm -hmm. um, I also like Dan Mullen down there at Florida. Yeah. I think Rich Rodriguez could be uh, an outside mm -hmm. look down there. I think uh, I either of those of two guys um, would really like that. Um, Brett McMurphy, who works for ESPN this morning, actually said um, that those two guys exactly like wouldn't be in that Florida job when the head coaching vacancy was filled. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was just him speaking or if he had – um, good sources who knew that. Mm -hmm. But those are the two guys that off the top of my head that I pulled. And when I saw that, I was like, well, I've got nothing outside. But uh, I think um, besides his report that Dan Mullen and Rich Rod are my two guys that I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are – I didn't even think about Rich, to be quite honest. That just kind of blew my mind a little <laughs> bit. But it'll be really interesting to see what happens in Gainesville. But moving on to the rest of college football, um, 
Florida State somehow rallied again. This is, I think this is probably the third week in a row they've rallied. I don't see how this is happening, but they beat Miami 30 to 26. Miami looked really strong going into the game. I thought they would have a chance of beating Florida. They they were the favorites in my book, granted. Uh, now they're six and four, three and three in the ACC. Florida State still undefeated, still looking for that one loss to show up at some point. Oregon State upset uh, Arizona State 35-27. Big game there for Oregon State. That uh, now snaps a four-game losing streak for them. Uh, really, really big performance. Five and five overall. Two and five in the Pac-12. Arizona State eight and two. Five and two in the Pac-12. Looking at some other games, TCU beat Kansas 34 to 30. Really thought TCU would have a bigger lead on that one, but Kansas really came out, showed their stuff. They're three and seven overall right now. One and six in the Big 12. Uh, Ohio State beat Minnesota 31 to 24. Arizona beat Washington 27 to 26. Really close one there uh, in a Pac-12 matchup. Michigan State beat Maryland 37 to 15. Wisconsin beat Nebraska 59 to 24. Uh, Gordon there set an FBS record of 408 yards there rushing. That's just absolutely insane. Good win there for the Badgers. Uh, Northwestern beat Notre Dame in a close one in overtime, 43-40. to uh, Georgia Tech, like we talked about earlier, they're looking really strong. They've really been playing really strong towards this end of the season. Uh, they beat Clemson 28-6. to uh, I know there were a few, there were quite a bit of interceptions thrown in that game. I think three last I knew of. That may be uh, incorrect, but I mean, good yeah, game there for Georgia Tech. Right. There that were is, three, and there were okay. two pick sixes. That is right. Yeah, I knew about the two pick sixes, but I wasn't sure about the... Um, last interception, really great there for Georgia Tech. Right now, I know Georgia Tech and Duke are still considered the two top runners in the um, ACC to stand a chance against Florida State. Really exciting to see what's going to happen there. But talking about Duke, they lost to Virginia Tech 17-16, to a close one there. Hokies had three, um, they forced three takeaways against um, the Blue Devils. Really surprising. Um, Duke's 8-2 and two now on the season, 4-2 and two in the ACC. Utah beat Stanford in a rather close one in overtime, 20 to uh, 17. Um, overall, pretty interesting weekend for college football. A few different upsets, but nothing too, too major. Um, it'll be really interesting to see what happens as we go into the final stretch of the season. A couple more games, a couple more weeks to be going on uh, here before we start really getting into the playoff system for the first time ever, which is going to be really exciting. But um, AP poll came out yesterday, top four teams, Florida State number one, Bama number two, Oregon three, Mississippi State moved down to number four. Um, could this be what's projected to be in the top four for the college football playoff rankings tomorrow morning that we'll find out about? Not really sure. I, don't, I think the committee will lean that way. Me personally, I like Baylor as the number four team. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Mississippi State with that loss, it'll, it'll all depend on uh, if they go into Oxford and plot a win. Um, I think uh, Ole Miss, too, could be a dark horse to pull into that final mm -hmm. four spot. But um, Baylor, they had um, one game where it's kind of a kind of an eh game, but they've looked strong mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, they beat a really good TCU team, came back. Yeah. Um, but Mississippi State in that four spot, I think the other three are pretty much dead set. Um, Florida State at number one, just because they're undefeated. You could go either way with them and Bama. Mm -hmm. But those four, I think, could be the way the committee leans tomorrow night. I think they hit all four teams correct. Uh, I don't agree with the order. I would put Bama one. Mm -hmm. uh, I would move Florida State to three. And the reason I would do that is just because I just don't think they've beaten anybody. Mm -hmm. They continue to squeak out these wins. Well, Miami's six and four. They're right. not ten and two. Mm -hmm. Miami's not the team that they once were. Uh, and they're squeaking out wins against these teams. I wouldn't put Florida State one. Uh, but I do agree keeping Mississippi State in. <laughs> I think that the committee rewards who you played when you played them. And uh, what was so great is if this was the BCS, Mississippi State would be so far gone because they just lost. Mm -hmm. But now, even though they're 9-1 and one and they just lost, TCU is 9-1. But their loss is so much greater than Mississippi State's. Mississippi State's going to stay in. I like this new committee system. I just I can't get enough of it. Uh, <laughs> but I do think the AP hit it on the head this time. Definitely. It'll be really exciting to see what happens tomorrow. And like I said, with the rest of the season for college football, the playoff system is, it was 
I know a lot of people were kind of apprehensive at first to how it would work out, but I'm getting a little bit more excited about it. I think it'll be really interesting. But moving on to the NFL, Peyton and the Broncos struggled yesterday. Um, Rams ended up beating them 22-7. I don't think anybody was expecting the Rams to come out and beat them. Even um, some of the players there were talking about how this is a big win for them. Um, because, I mean, you wouldn't expect to beat a team that goes out and puts up like double-digit points every week. But to for the Broncos to be held to seven points, that was really surprising. Peyton, uh, 34 for 54, 389 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. That one touchdown came late in the second quarter to Emmanuel Sanders. Um, but this game ends a 15-game streak with at least two touchdown passes thrown by Peyton, which is just insane to think about. But um, I know one thing that a lot of people are talking about are the three big injuries that came up during last night's game. Uh, Julius Thomas, Monty Ball, and Emmanuel Sanders all suffered injuries last night. I don't really know what to expect with this Broncos team. I hope that they're not deteriorating. I mean, they had a, a tough loss to the Patriots a couple weeks back. But um, it's it was just really surprising to see that. I mean, Peyton still had a really okay performance. I mean, 389 yards, that's really good there. But two interceptions just makes you wonder what's happening with this Broncos team. Yeah, uh, it's it's scary for the Broncos because you got a – well, the best quarterback, in my opinion, in the NFL and Peyton Manning. But now he's losing his playmakers – and everybody knows that Peyton Manning can't get it done by himself. Mm -hmm. He has to have somebody, as everybody does. And uh, it's scary if you're a Broncos fan. I, I don't think they're going to be the top seed in the AFC this year, and that's killer mm -hmm. because when Peyton has to travel, yeah. he doesn't do as well. Um, and they can't afford to lose too many because mm -hmm. they have to play in Foxborough. Yep. In the or mm -hmm. if they have to go back. I wouldn't trust him in Indianapolis again. Right. I wouldn't even like him in Kansas City. So, things get interesting when they keep losing. Uh, I personally think they're going to be okay, but it is scary mm -hmm. if you're a Broncos fan or even a Peyton fan mm -hmm. that he might not be able to get it done this year. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. And just how many guys can he can he deal with and can he deal without? Uh, Julius Thomas, he's a big touchdown catcher, mm -hmm. a big target for Peyton in the red zone. Emmanuel Sanders was stepping into his own. Definitely. He's making a lot of big plays. Um, Monte Ball. Um, and so... It'll be interesting to see uh, how well Peyton fares with the guys down mm -hmm. down the road. I think they'll be all right, but uh, in playoff time, if they mm -hmm. have to deal without any of those guys and they have to travel because of some of the regular season losses, it, it, it could be interesting. Definitely. Uh, last night, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers just completely dominated the Eagles. Another dominating performance. This is a few weeks in a row now that they've done really well. They beat the Eagles 53-20. to Aaron Rodgers alone, 22 for 36, 341 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Aaron Rodgers ended up breaking Tom Brady's record of 288 straight passes at home without an interception, and that wasn't the only record that was set last night. Uh, the Packers set another record, four straight home games with at least 28 points scored in the first half, which puts them up to outscoring opponents 128-9 to nine before halftime in that stretch. That's just, I mean, we knew that the Packers were a strong team, but 128-9 to nine in the before going into halftime, that's just absolutely insane. But it should also be noted, Mark Sanchez, 28 for 44 last night, 346 yards, really high numbers there, two touchdowns, two interceptions. Mark Sanchez kind of been like the joke of the league, you could say. There's always jokes going around with him. But, I mean, to have those two touchdowns and 346 yards, not a bad performance from him. But the Packers, I mean, is there any way to stop them right now with the run that they're having? No, no. The Green Bay Packers, in my opinion, are the best team in the NFC right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's going to change for at least three more weeks. Yeah. Uh, they're just on an absolute tear. And they're getting to play some teams at home now. And on the frozen tundra, not many people go up there and win, mm -hmm. except for Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. Right. So like he told us a couple weeks ago, we all seem to relax and let him take care of business because he's doing just that. Mm -hmm. um, they've been scoring points in bunches, and um, it's looking nice. If they can keep that up and, or keep some of that up, they're going to be a, a tough team to beat in the mm -hmm. NFC. Definitely. And looking over at the Patriots game last night, they beat the Colts in demanding fashion, 42-20. to Tom Brady, 19 for 30, 257 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions. But what everybody's talking about is Jonas Gray. Um, he had a huge day for the Patriots, 38 carries, 199 yards with four touchdowns. Really impressive from him. Um, 
I mean, whenever you think about the Patriots, you always think about a passing game. But for him to come out and score four touchdowns there, that was really good for New England. Yeah, you know, of course, the one week that I'm playing, the guy who has Gray, he decides to play him. Right. And he just goes off, I'm going to lose this week, but <laughs> not bitter. Um, no, the Patriots looked really good. They're getting, they're going to get some steam behind them now. And Gray won't have the same performance that he did next week. If he, he, I mean, he could. Mm-hmm. But he probably won't. But I, I think the bigger storyline in that game is they went to Indianapolis against a really good Colts team mm-hmm. and dominated the whole game. Yeah. From the passing to running to defense, it was all Patriots the whole time. And uh, Tom Brady's getting those guys going. Bill Belichick's got them playing good. Uh, Patriots are a good team, and they just proved it last night. Yeah, I think the AFC and the rest of the league should be scared of a team that I just mm-hmm. found that they can run the ball really well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jonas Gray may not be a superstar, but last night he and an offensive line that uh, newfound confidence, and they ran the ball mm-hmm. extremely well. And yeah. a team that's known for Tom Brady and throwing the ball just, just ran the ball all over the Colts last night. And uh, it's scary to think that they get a good defense, and if they get a whole package on offense, mm-hmm. um, that's a team who could be a number one seed in AFC, playing up there, home field advantage, and uh, be looking to make a deep run in the playoffs. Definitely, and looking around the league, uh, the Dolphins beat the Bills 22-9, uh, Bears beat the Vikings in a fairly close one, 21-13, Texans blew out the Browns 23-7 to there, Browns, they were they had a share of the AFC North, things could be changing after this week with that loss there, uh, the Chiefs beat the Seahawks 24-20, to Panthers lost to the Falcons 19-17, to really close one there. Uh, Bengals beat the Saints 27 to 10. Buccaneers beat the Redskins 27 to 7, which is really interesting. Uh, a lot of the fans uh, in Washington were uh, chanting for uh, McCoy to come back in and replace uh, RG3. Not much of a surprise. I mean, Colt McCoy came out a couple weeks ago, just completely dominated and showed that he still has what it takes to be in the league. That's, that was really powerful from him, so maybe we'll see him starting for the Redskins sometime soon. Uh, Rams, like we said, they beat the Broncos 22-7. to Giants lost to the 49ers 16-10, to but what everybody's talking about is Eli Manning throwing five interceptions. Um, I heard a few people say that it's Eli back to being the Eli we all know and love. Um, I mean, we still love Eli. He has those Manning genes, but five interceptions, it's really tough. Uh, the Chargers beat the Raiders 13-6. to Cardinals are still showing that they are just a dominating force. They beat the Lions 14-6, to which brings the Cardinals up to 9-1 and in the season, 6-0 and at home. And then uh, tonight we'll be seeing a Monday night matchup between the Titans and the Steelers, both teams coming off of losses last week. Um, Titans lost to the Ravens. Steelers lost to the Jets, which is still really surprising to think about, but um, should be a really good game tonight um, in Nashville. It's all going to be about who's going to come out for redemption. Both teams are looking for it. Um, I mean, Titans have struggled. They're two and seven this season. Steelers are six and four. But there's just a lot to look forward to with tonight. Yeah, uh, if you're a Titans fan, your season's pretty much over. So for us Titans people, I hate to say it, we're two and seven. We're not going to the playoffs. No. Not happening. But you get your rival, the Steelers, into town. On Monday Night Football, the whole country's going to be watching because it's Monday night. They don't care who's playing. You might be able to steal one from the Steelers. Uh, I don't think so. I think the Steelers are too mad about last week with the Jets, and they should just come into Nashville and roll over the Titans, Uh, especially because the Titans' pass defense is horrendous. Antonio Brown's just going to go off. But, uh, no, you might be able to take one from them, and it'd be a big win. Uh, for Ken Wizen on the Titans. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm with you, Andrew. I don't see it happening. Um, it's possible. Just You never know what to expect with the Titans, mm-hmm. although now we're starting to expect a lot less when you mm-hmm. don't know what to expect. Right. Um, I, I still think the Steelers are going to come out. I'm not happy after what happened with them in the Jets last week and come out and, and beat the Titans at home. Mm-hmm. Just It's sad for us Titans fans to say that and the Gosh. way our season's been going, but uh, I think it'll happen mm-hmm. like that tonight. Coming from a Steelers fan, I'm kind of worried about this game tonight. 
Uh, it's not easy being a Steelers fan here in Tennessee with all the Titans fans around because they're always putting <laughs> stuff out there about the team. But um, <laughs> like you said, there's, you can't really you don't really know what to expect with the Titans, but it's still really tough to know what to expect with the Steelers. I mean, last week everybody thought Steelers would just come out and dominate uh, the Jets, but there were four forced turnovers from the Jets' defense. Antonio Brown just looked really soft last week. Um he was just dropping passes left and right. Ben Roethlisberger still had an okay performance last week, but, um, I mean, he has 3,000 yards this season, 23 touchdowns. Antonio Brown has a thousand, over 1,000 yards and eight touchdowns there. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens, but um, nonetheless very exciting because it is Monday Night Football, and who doesn't love a good Monday Night Football matchup? But before we close out the show, we're going to talk about UT basketball really quick. Uh, the men played against VCU uh, this past Friday night, and they lost 85-69. to 69. Um, Kind of what most people were expecting, VCU is one of the better teams in the nation, in my opinion. They're solid. Um, but uh, looking at Tennessee, Josh Richardson came out and scored 17 points. Not too bad there, but the main re- the main... Um, key to this loss was the rebounds. I mean, the Vols just got out-rebounded like crazy. If you look at their leading rebounder for VCU, Graham had 14 rebounds alone. That's just, that's pretty insane there. Yeah, he, him and the whole VCU uh, big man and their guard just took advantage of Tennessee on the boards. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was a time when Tennessee had it at eight points, and there was still eight minutes left in the game, and he thought mm-hmm. they might be able to get this thing close and win. But they could not rebound the basketball. Mm-hmm. VCU got too many second chances. I would love to see second chance points for VCU. Mm-hmm. It had to be way up in the 20s. Uh, they dominated Tennessee on the boards. And that's something Donnie Tindall stresses is mm-hmm. aggression on rebounding and his full court press. And I don't think either were very good mm-hmm. in the opener. Uh, I'm excited to see him progress through this non conference because, as bad as the SEC is, you might be able to win some games in your league and make a run in your tournament to get good enough to make it. Maybe the NCAA, probably the NIT with this team. Not, I don't expect much from this team, but rebounding is something you can't control. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, that was just frustrating. Yeah, rebounding and turnovers is going to be a focus point coming up. Um, it's a tough first game to have. Uh, VCU's got, uh, got a, a wreck havoc defense, and yeah. that showed. Um, they're all over the floor. They show a bunch of different press looks, and uh, they forced a bunch of Tennessee turnovers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's good to get the team out there, um, play a full game, first mm-hmm. game under Tyndall. Um, I think they'll be pretty good um, for what we expect of them. I don't know that 13th in the SEC is where we're going to see them at the end of the year, but mm-hmm. also don't think we can see them in the top half of the SEC. Just too many new guys, um, too much to expect from a new new coach, new system, new guys. But um, we'll have some exciting points for them this year, and I'm looking forward to see how they play. Definitely in the next game for the Vols will be on Thursday at home at 7 o'clock versus Texas Southern. Uh, looking over at the women, they beat Penn on uh, Friday night 97-52. to In the two opening games for the Lady Vols, they have scored 90-plus points. 97 in the, uh, this game, 90 um, in the previous uh, game that they had. But, I mean, they've just looked really dominating. Really dominant the first few games, I should say. Uh, more for this game, 22 points and 14 rebounds there. Really impressive from her. And the next game for the Lady Vols will be Monday night. So tonight at 7 o'clock against Oral Roberts here at home at Thompson Bowling Arena. So should be really exciting. It's good. Like I said last week, it's great to have basketball um, back on Rocky Top. I know we've missed it, especially with football season dwindling down. It's good to move on to another sport. But that's all that we have this week. Next week, we'll talk more about uh, the game against Mizzou. Look ahead at uh, Vanderbilt. Probably talk about some Heisman candidates. I know there's already speculation for next year's Heismans that are um, already up, and we can go ahead and say that people are putting Dobbs in there. But um, it'll be really exciting. Uh, we'll see what's left with uh, the college football season, talk more about the NFL. So that's it for this week. We will see you next week.